Mm -hmm. All set. Okay, great. Um, so welcome to the March 19th meeting of the Edgemont Board of Education. Um, our first order of business is the minutes from the February 27th meeting. Can I have a motion? Noreen, second Doya. Uh, any questions, concerns? All in favor? Aye. Okay, uh, unanimous. Uh, passed unanimously. Okay, the second is the uh, minutes from the February 29th meeting. Can I have a motion? Yalesh and Grace, uh, second. Uh, any questions, concerns? I, All in favor? I can vote on these, right? Yeah, for you yes. Yes, yeah. we can. All in favor? Oh, yeah, I just voted on the first one. The, um, yes, right. Um, so just by way of what we, for everybody's information, we have new district clerk and a new dist uh, assistant district clerk um, who are working with us. Um, we've had now a few meetings. If anybody wants to have any give any feedback about the minutes from the meetings, just let me know so we can give um, give some feedback on the minutes, level of detail, et cetera. Um, it's all good. So just um, now that we've had a couple meetings. We have no treasurer's report tonight, but we next we have recognition of community. So I'll pass it to you, Dr. Yes. Good evening. It is my great pleasure to share with you that our EHS music department competed at the National Job uh, Jazz Festival in Philadelphia on um, February 9th through 11th and walked away with some very impressive awards. And I'd like to ask Mr. Hosier if he would come forward and share a little more about these awards. And afterwards, we will have a special student performance this evening. Thank you, Dr. Hamilton. It's my pleasure to acknowledge our talented students in our EHS music department for their success at the National Jazz Festival in Philadelphia back in February. The following students earned the Solo Jazz Singer Top 10 Vocalist Awards. Grace Barron, Baron Gallup, Andrea Lee, Layla Haston, Melissa Wang, and Colin Young. Charlotte Blotner won the Judges' Choice Award for Jazz Ensemble. In the Jazz Ensemble Small category, EHS won honorable mention, and Theo Hornblum won the Outstanding Musician and Judges Choice Awards. In the Large Vocal Jazz Ensemble category, EHS won second place, and Grace Barron won the Judges Choice Award. And in the Acapella Ensemble category, EHS won first place. I think it's important to note that this is the 10th time in 11 years that we've won first place in this category. And Sam Ryan won the Outstanding Musician Award and Judges' Choice Awards. I want to congratulate our very talented students, Ms. Morse and Mr. Lagrasso. We have great visitors to hear about these awards. We have something better in store for you tonight. We have our talented students here who will perform several songs for you. We'll turn it over to Ms. Morris. Thank you, Dr. Hamilton. I did. I knew I was. Sure, yeah. Sounds like a plan. Oh, this is like a little tricky, isn't it? Yeah, right. That's a good Get back to seat in the hall page. Thank you so much for having us here this evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to perform for you. The first piece that we're going to sing for you is uh, a piece that we commissioned this year um, with the great Carrie Marsh called That Face. We want to thank our administration for their support and uh, for this amazing collaboration with Carrie, who's like over now as uh, arrangers. This was a great project for us. And we hope you enjoy.
is from Ward Swingle, the Swingle Singers, All the Things You Are. Oh, 
Um, I also want to recognize our rhythm section. Where are they at? Here we are. Oh, they're up here. We have support for the rhythm section, but obviously for logistic purposes, we need acapella music. So rhythm section. We Thank you guys for having us. <laughs> 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 And we're going to go back to the auditorium for rehearsal. It's our rehearsal night. Thank you. I was going to say, let's talk about a budget. <laughs> Anybody? Budget? <laughs> that was incredible. Thank you to Miss Morris and Mr. Lagrasso and the entire group. And it's just, yeah, no, no, it's really, it's a, it's a reminder about why we're here. So, sure. Um, For sure. That, um, okay. So we'll move on to the other half of recognition of community. Do we have anybody who would like to speak? We do. We have a few shorts. Great. So 
So while you're coming down, I'm just going to read my normal statement. So you can walk on down. Yeah. Right. Where's John? That's that looks like a real microphone. Like mm -hmm. progress. OK, um, so recognition of community includes the opportunity for community members to offer their thoughts to the board on any issues in the district, including those on the agenda. The board can't and won't respond to any questions asked in public comment. We have a specific agenda for this meeting. However, if warranted, the board will follow up on issues raised during public comment outside of the meeting or potentially add it to a future agenda if there is relevant updates for the community. Each community member can speak for up to three minutes and public comment will last for a total of 30 minutes. Jennifer will give you a verbal uh, cue when, uh, when you're 30 minutes from the end of your time. So. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I'll say, don't forget that day. You can't hurt that and make your day better. So hmm. congratulations to everyone. It is what this group is about. And actually what I'm going to talk about is from my heart. And it's also what the school is about. Mm -hmm. Um, you received a letter yesterday, finally, from the town, much later than what you had in my work, about our delivery. And I did ask a question, and I can't answer it tonight, but I appreciate an answer in the future, also an answer to the town. They ask you uh, to put sidewalks on artil all the way down artillery lane as part of the artillery lane access road project that was from Garrett to Mr. Paul. And I would appreciate uh, the school district responding to that request. It's important that we do. Second, I have an opportunity to thank you for putting the environmental impact uh, statement up on the on the uh, website. That was very much appreciated. I read it. I read the traffic report in detail. Thank you for actually updating the traffic report during the additional traffic schedule on February twenty seventh. Uh, having said that, uh, it, what it does, I want to bring up a few things for it from that. It actually grades the uh, corner of Artillery Lane uh, and that's right road from what is now an A2P uh, during the drop off. <laughs> um, there is no discussion of any stop signs, left turn in, left turn, nothing there. And all I'm suggesting is the impact. And there's also a discussion of how the traffic gets there. So when I'm just, again, strongly suggesting whatever you do tonight, I think you both decided, you need to work closely with the town. And I'm also, as you know, lobbying the town as chair of the planning board as well. I've been talking to the town. But working closer with the town and also the child's traffic consultant, as to what the impact of that's going to be on the old Edgemont community. Separately, um, there was no discussion in the updated traffic study about Marcy Road. Uh, right now, just to make for a point of clarification, as you know, there is no final approval for that curb cut. It requires a permit approval, which is right now in the hands of the town. If the town has changes, it goes back, it's referred back to the district county, where then we open the review. Again, I strongly urge this committee, whatever you do with the bond issue, you know what I think you should do with the bond issue. We'll just split it, but you're not going to do that. Mr. Schwartz, thank you. Thank you very much. I'll be done. Uh, I just want to make sure that you work closely with the safety of our kids. Uh, the safety of these kids is the most important thing versus, versus anything else that bond issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, just one point of clarification. If you look in the traffic study, there is an updated traffic study for artillery road, uh, for artillery road as well. You can find it there. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Uh, we are on to, is that, sorry, is that it? That's it. Okay. We are on to acceptance of gifts. Okay. Yes, yes. It is my pleasure to present almost $30,000 this evening uh, of gifts for the following, from the following donors for the following purposes from the Edgemont Elementary PTA in the amount of $1,600 to Greenville, for a library program with Tommy McKean for third grade students. From the Edgemont Junior Senior High PTSA, $200 to the Edgemont Junior Senior High School for prizes for STEAM fair activities, which I am super excited about. Um, the To Edgemont Junior Senior High, from the Edgemont Junior Senior High PTSA in the amount of $1,200 to Edgemont Junior Senior High for the play group theater. 
for um, Edgemont Elementary PTA in the amount of $1,000 to Sealy Place for the Hudson Clearwater Stoop Trip for grades four through six students and the E-Club in the amount of $24,796.73 to the athletic program for new hurdles for our track program, a pitching machine for our baseball team, various training equipment for our soccer teams, as well as funds that support our wrestling team annual Wriggle in the plane strip to upstate New York. <laughs> okay. Do I have a motion to accept these gifts? Um, Jennifer, second Nilesh. Any questions or comments? Okay. All in favor? Okay. Everybody with one abstention. Yes. yes. So once again, thank you, thank you, thank you to the Edgemont PTA, the Edgemont PTSA, and the E-Club for these super generous gifts, which all go straight to facilities, supplies, and programming that impact our students. Again, we are so thankful to all the community organizations run by volunteers and supported by our community, and which provide important additional funding for us to offer enhanced programs for our students. And this is a, a huge gift from the E-Club for, for things that are all little small things that have to get done. And so it's really great for them to, um, to support that for us. So, um, okay, uh, board committee reports. I don't think the only, I think committee that's met this past week is finance and the whole evening is a committee report. So we'll just move on to that. Um, I don't have anything else to say at this moment. Um, and I think- uh, Just real quick, I, um, I know we're gonna be talking about budget under a separate item, but since they're all here, I really just wanted to give a special thank you to our administrative team uh, for such a concerted effort uh, to put this budget together that will be presented um, in greater detail later this evening uh, and how appreciative I am of the work that they do at the school and department levels to support the district efforts. Great, ditto. Thank you. Um, and just um, just a note, this is kind of a little bit of a weird meeting. We are going to kind of conclude the business of the board tonight, and then we're going to move into a business meeting, uh, not business meeting, well, a, work a work session, session. <laughs> a work session where we will just kind of operate as a as a board kind of talking and asking questions um, about the, the budget. You're more than welcome to stay, but it does mean we're going to kind of run through the business meeting pretty quickly and then and then move on to the to the work session. Um, so with that, we are on to the consent portion of our agenda. Yes. Um, um, you'll notice when we get to the business report, um, I'm pulling out uh, resolutions K2 and K3, which I'll talk about a little more in a second. Uh, it is the recommendation of the superintendent that the board approve the following recommendations by consent vote. That's personnel matters I-1 through I-7, which includes resignations, appointments, and amendments to a private uh, appointment of coaches, uh, student matter J1, which is the committee recommendations for the committee on special education and preschool, and business items K1 and K4 through K11. K2 and K3 must be presented by roll call vote. Uh, K1 and K4 through K11 includes budget transfers, authorization to enter into various agreements, authorization to form a new student club, uh, specifically the Water Safety Club, and authorization to dispose of obsolete and broken equipment. Great. May I have a motion? Nilesh, second Jennifer. Any questions or comments? Yeah, so I'll, I'll just take a comment on the two clubs. Uh, so we have a new club, uh, Water Safety Club, and thank you, Toby Saracino, for supporting that club. I'm also pleased to see our senior student, Abhik Agrawal, stepping up as a part-time debate coach mm -hmm. for the Lost of Coach. So thank you, Abhik, for doing that. Thank you. Great. All in favor? Great. And you're unanimous. Okay. okay. Um, next, K2, the authorization to approve resolution per CICRA, which is the New York State Environmental Quality Review Act. Provisions and regulations for the 2024 capital bond, including proposed work at the Edgemont Junior Senior High School, the Sealy Place Elementary School, and the Greenville Elementary School, as provided in the documents attached in your agenda. 
So I would like to just, before we kind of go through the roll call, I would just like to thank our provider for writing a very, very detailed report. We really appreciate all the detail you put into it and um, your, your um, third party review of the projects that we, um, that we are looking to do as part of this bond. So um, do you have anything else you want to- Just point of clarification, no roll call necessary for this one, just K3. Okay. I, I did want to take the opportunity just to fill out for people, just if someone could, whoever's appropriate, just provide just a little bit of color in terms of how we got to this point, you know, what, what processes we had to follow and what standards we had to meet and, and just kind of explain how we got here. Director, do you want to do, get a motion? First and then go. go and I still the, would, while I'm not required, I'd still like to do a roll call yes, vote let's on do this. That. Got it. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so let's do a motion. Anyone? Noreen, second. So yeah. Um, okay. So. Sure. I'll I'll, I'll take the first uh, part. I think. Uh, so the secret process is an important step for us before we engage in any um, significant capital projects in the district. Um, this has been an ongoing process for us, really dating back to 2021 when we first looked at this. Um, and the board did adopt a secret resolution at that time um, related to the scope of work that was contained in the 21 bond. Um, since that time, obviously, we made changes to the scope. We removed a significant portion of the project and have added some new elements. Um, and so with consultation with our legal department, uh, we began the process from scratch to ensure that we were really looking at it today uh, with today's lens, with today's facts. Um, so to do that, we, we chose to engage a third party consultant uh, in bioscience um, when Catherine Laudengard is here today. Um, she's the one who performed the analysis for us. Um, she worked uh, directly with our architects to get scope documents, understand um, the impact um, associated with the work that was planned. Um, really, the, as uh, the outside consultant, they're determining the necessary conditions um, regarding the coordination, reviewing studies conducted as part of the scope determinations, some of which were spoken about earlier this evening, um, and they determine necessary actions uh, that will be taken. Um, what you'll find in the documents here is the action determined for the scope of the whole project was unlisted. Um, and based on the action that is determined, that guides the next steps in the process. Um, whether the school district needs to proceed with a, a short analysis or a complete analysis. Um, and in this case here, um, it required the completion of um, the short environmental assessment form, which you've all seen as part of um, your board packets and is presented uh, currently on board docs. Simultaneously, the district has engaged our council. So our legal counsel, both um, in terms of general analysis uh, to make sure that we're following legal uh, requirements as it relates to CICRA, um, and also bond counsel to make sure that the timelines and all aspects of um, the analysis that has been performed align with the necessary um, stages in the process in order for the board to take action this evening regarding a resolution, um, which would be the second aspect of tonight's. Um, I'd say simultaneous to that, we've been engaging outside groups, collaborating with the town, um, getting feedback on the designs as well to make sure that we are meeting the standards and thresholds um, that we want to, that have been desired as part of this project, um, and to make sure that we've taken into consideration many of those recommendations that have been brought forward to us uh, from the town in this analysis. Thank you. Great. Any other questions? That secret? No. Okay. So why don't we go ahead and still do a roll call for this for this one as well? Yeah, but this is for K two. K two, Madam Chairman, have you vote? Yes. Jennifer. Yes. Nilesh. Yes. Julia. Yes. Grace. Yes. Noreen. Yes. Heather. Yes. Okay. Um, resolution passes. passes. Yes. Okay. And then resolution K3, which is the resolution of the Board of Education of the Edgemont Union Free School District at Greenberg, New York, at Greenberg, New York, adopted March 19th, 2024, directing submission of a bond proposition at the annual district meeting and election of the qualified voters of said school district to be held on May 21st, 2024, and prescribing the form of such bond proposal to be inserted in the notice of such annual district meeting and election. Okay, can I have a motion? Grace, second, Jennifer. Um, anybody else have anything to say? I have some news. Anybody else have anything to say? No? Okay. So before we vote on this resolution, which has been um, a long time coming, some of us have been working on this, been a five year effort. Um, and none of these elements were identified without significant work and research. 
As we go through the roll call, please know that all the board members have done a tremendous amount of work and a, a done a great job understanding the details of the bond. I mean, I didn't really know how to read a traffic report before this, and now I feel like maybe I should get a new job. But um, <laughs> but we have had to weigh the inevitable trade-offs of these various projects and work to educate the community on the elements of the bond. I personally am so excited about where this bond is gonna take the Edgemont schools. The opportunities for extending our curriculum and programming, the space that will enable teacher, student and administrator collaboration, and the comfort and safety of our students during the day and during critical times before and after the school day are all so important and are all, are all taken care of in this bond. So the Oscars music would definitely start to play before I can get to everybody that we need to thank, but I will start with the administration, Ken, Brian, and their teams. Um, John D'Angelo and his team, uh, Triton Construction, Ray as kind of our, um, our know-all uh, and kind of fresh set of eyes on this bond, which was super critical when we, um, when we started uh, again this, this past year. Um, our bond and district council, thanks lawyers, um, our partners in the town and all of the experts. And there are a lot of them that have helped us um, across all aspects of the planning, planning and evaluation, ensuring that this bond will deliver on the great expectations and goals that we have laid out almost five years ago and modified based on the new needs this year. So with that, we can do a roll call. Okay, for item K number three, Councilor, how do you vote? Yes. Jennifer? Absolutely, yes. Nilesh? Yes. Julia? Yes. Grace? Yes. Noreen? Yes. Heather? Motion passes, thank you. Okay, so we will adjourn this meeting um, and we will reopen up for a um, the budget uh, work session. Um, our next business meeting will be held on Tuesday, April 16th, 2024. Um, during, that bud during that meeting, we will have a vote on the BOCES budget and um, the BOCES election in case um, that's of interest. And all meetings begin at six o'clock and immediately adjourn to executive session and our public session will start again at seven. So we look forward to seeing everyone at our next meeting and you're more than welcome to stay for our, for our okay. conversation about the budget, which should be interesting as well. So with that, we are adjourned and now I need a motion to, uh, a motion to open a new meeting, the budget work session. So moved, still yeah. Second, sure. Jennifer. Okay, we are in session for the budget work session. Hopefully, these things are here, right? So I'm not going to actually. You know what? Pick this thing up. Okay. How do you want to? Well, uh, this <laughs> evening, we are very pleased again to uh, present what um, the administrative team puts forward for the board to consider. Uh, hopefully, at this juncture, you've uh, been fully advised and questions have been answered. However, um, as uh, standards and uh, regular policies and procedures would dictate, uh, tonight is a work session, which gives you an, uh, an opportunity for a more interactive approach. Our administrators are here if there are questions that are specific to a particular building or department, um, but we'd be happy to answer uh, any questions with tremendous detail if necessary um, around the proposed budget, as well as the various revenue sources and ultimately the tax impact. I will like to ask Brian if he will just share, I asked Brian to, well, Brian shared that he had put together some perspectives relative to uh, going to the cap and not going to the cap and what a um, look forward approach might be. And I think it's important for us to always remember that when working on school budgets, it's essential to look not just at the current year, but to look at future years as well. Ideally five years, but given the nature of schools, that's very difficult to do. But certainly looking at a three-year snapshot to anticipate how this budget may impact future budgets and how that will impact ultimately tax levy and then, of course, our taxpayers. So, Brian, you will? We all ready? All right. All right. So I apologize. I'm going to try to stay on script to keep it as concise as I can, but there's a lot to talk about. 
Um, so I will take a look at my notes here and, and making sure that guides us that we hit on each of the parts. If you have your binders, uh, they will be helpful. If not, you can certainly share with others, but it's certainly not critical that it's available to you. Uh, for all the administrators in the audience, those who are end up watching this um, at their leisure online, um, the documents, some of the documents that we'll reference are contained in your packets um, or have been presented to you tonight as these three handouts uh, that you'll see. Uh, last week, when we presented our administrative budget proposal for the 24-25 school year, um, we just to summarize the key elements, the proposed operating budget is $72,118,709, which equates to a 3.96 budget to budget increase. To meet that operating need uh, within that budget, we proposed a tax levy of $61,133,389. This is the maximum allowable tax levy without exceeding the tax cap next year. This corresponds to a 3.95% levy to levy increase. And then the last thing I'll say, and if um, you take note, one of the documents I handed out to you tonight is just an updated revenue um, and tax rate projection. There is only one line that differs on here and it relates to the tax rate. Um, Although the district's final actual assessed value will not be finalized until later in the year for the tax rolls, um, we did get an update from the town assessor since our last meeting. And so we'll use that figure as the assumed assessed value going forward in this budget process. Um, the value that was provided to us uh, by the assessor is slightly higher than what it was previously. And so since there's an inverse relationship, um, as the assessment value goes up, the tax rate um, will decrease. And so you'll see now our proposed increase um, or change in the tax rate is 4.17%. Um, and we'll keep to that number now rather than making individual changes each time a new settlement has been reached um, at the town level. Uh, the other two documents that I gave out to you this evening um, are printed on legal paper there. One, which will be the first one that we look at in greater detail um, is the four-year personnel budget by category. And then the second being the same category sheet that you've seen previously, um, but highlighted for you to um, identify some of the areas that we'll focus on this evening that we haven't otherwise already unpacked to a great extent. So you'll, this does not mean these are the only material um, uh, function codes that we're looking at, but more, we're not going to, I'm not going to make a overarching presentation on curriculum instruction assessment or technology. Those have already been presented to you at length at previous meetings. Um, obviously questions we can take on that after that. My goal this evening is really threefold. It's to provide the additional details regarding the personnel expenses, since that represents the largest uh, percentage of our overall costs, unpack those categories that were not previously focused on in past meetings, um, and provide the board with opportunities to ask questions about any aspect of the proposed budget or its development. So if I can draw your attention to the sheet that's titled four-year personnel budget by category here. On that sheet, you'll find six categories that comprise our personnel expenses. And at $56,940,000, these expenses make up 79% of the proposed budget. Generally, these expenses are mandated or driven by contractual obligations or are assumed obligations and are inclusive of contingency appointments. Namely, the contingencies included on the personnel side amount to 2.0 full-time equivalent teachers with benefits and health insurance contingencies for those who may make changes to their health insurance status throughout the year. The salaries alone at $39,209,427 represents 54% of the overall budget. So we're more than halfway done in our conversation. Um, the 3.5% increase in salary allocation provides the necessary funding to support all anticipated contractual obligations while maintaining the programs offered in the current year and is inclusive of contractual salary schedule increases and lane changes and step increases that come. Uh, for those who uh, recall from our recent negotiations, per contractual terms, members of all four of our bargaining units, so that's the Teachers Association, uh, the Clerical Custodial, um, the Clerical School Nurses Technology Unit, the Custodian and Maintenance Unit, and our Teacher Aid Unit, they'll all receive increases uh, to their respective salary schedules next year to the tune of 2%. Two of those units, the Teachers Association and our Clerical School Nurses and Technology Unit, um, have the CPI embedded uh, range of values that we negotiated from 1.6 to 2%, uh, depending on CPI. 
since the CPI came in for the budget calculation at 4.12%, it was above the ceiling, um, the highest value. And so both of those units will be getting the maximum um, per negotiations of 2% next year. The other two units uh, will see that same CPI dependent calculation go into effect in the subsequent year. And so all four bargaining units will be under that one six to 2% increase depending on where CPI falls. The salary increases for staff members that are unaffiliated with a collective bargaining unit have also been included in the administrative budget proposal, including uh, the following groups, administrators, security staff, the superintendent secretary, and the athletic trainer, um, all of which would fall outside of collective bargaining units. Here. If you do have your binder and you want to turn to the salary tab, you'll see a page in the front uh, that breaks down the salaries by percentage of the overall. And you'll note that the teacher group, which includes in this case, the counselor and psychologist and teaching assistants, they constitute 69% of the overall anticipated salary outlay while making up 55% of our staff. Um, so this is 194.7 full-time equivalent individuals. So this is uh, by far the vast majority of our overall um, employees. And so of course, um, it represents the largest percent of the pie. In decreasing order of magnitude, the administrators make up 7.6% of the overall salaries while representing 4.2% of staff. The facilities, custodial and maintenance staff make up 6.7% of the salaries while constituting 79% of our staff. Teacher aides make up 6.4% of the overall salaries um, while representing 22% of our overall staff. And lastly, our clerical school nursing and technology staff make up approximately 6% of the overall salaries while making up just under 10% of our overall staff. With enrollment anticipated to decrease next year, Best estimates that we have uh, presented two um, different models for you in your binders is an estimate of 1,802 students. That's a 6% decrease year over year. We've planned for a reduction in staff of up three teachers and one teaching assistant next year. Contained within our proposal is the planned increase of one clerical support staff member at $65,318 to support the human resource office, resulting in a net decrease of three full-time equivalent employees when compared to last year or the current year's budget. Additionally, the proposed budget includes holdings for two full-time teacher equivalent uh, contingencies for areas where enrollment and course selection are ongoing. To use a benchmark, we're using uh, master's plus 30 at step five. Each year we kind of keep increasing that. It seems to be the candidate pool um, has, is often driving us to higher above step one or above just the basic master's level. Um, so that's about $100,000 per employee on each of those contingencies. Moving to health insurance and Medicare uh, costs, I'm gonna lump those two lines together since they really represent the overall um, healthcare benefits provided by the district. This represents 13% of the overall budget. Again, put that together with salaries, we're already at 67% of the overall. This year's composite rate increase of 11% to the health insurance premium is up from 8% the previous year and 1.5% the year before that. The composite rate includes active and retiree premiums. And despite all efforts to limit the increase, Swiss CHIP, which is the statewide school cooperative health plan, like many other possible providers, has been forced to raise rates significantly in the coming years. The total district contribution is the net figure after our employees make their own contributions. And that differs by bargaining. Unit. So teachers and administrators will pay 18.5% of the premium. The clerical staff, 15% of the premium. Custodial and maintenance staff, 15% of the premium. And our teacher aides are not provided um, health insurance from the district. However, those that have reached certain milestones in terms of years of service are given a stipend in lieu of um, payment of health insurance. Here's the impact. The 11% composite premium increase results in an increased budget to budget of $667,000 or approximately a 25% of the budget to budget increase that we've presented. So the health insurance increases alone are a quarter of the increase that you're seeing on the total budget from the current year to next year. 
over two years, increases to health insurance premiums have resulted in a $1.2 million net increase to the budget. That is the largest driver um, of overall expenditures in the district that we have no control over uh, or little control over um, annually. If you turn to the health insurance tab in your binder, and I believe what would be the second page for you, there's a memo from Dr. Peter Mustich, the executive director of SWIFT SHIP, providing the 24-25 rates. And I think it's just important to put this in context rather than the aggregate, the whole. So a family plan currently, um, as proposed for next year, would cost $35,980 per employee. So with district contributions ranging between 30,500 and 29,325, depending on which unit you're in. And so for each employee who selects a family health plan, that carrying cost, um, that, I feel like it just gives more context when we look at it as one, as opposed to the aggregate of all. Additionally, you'll find a chart that outlines comparable contribution rates between Swiss Ship and Nice Ship. Nice Ship is the New York State Health Insurance Plan. It's the other provider um, or consortium that is uh, used locally by school districts. Um, you'll note on there that the average monthly composite rate difference under Swiss Chip is $230 lower than that under Nice Ship. Um, they've done the analysis for us um, and showed us that both the three and five year average composite rate increases are significantly lower under Swiss Chip than what has been calculated under Nice Ship in the last two years. You don't have that, Doug? Mm -mm. Not so. Okay, I'll get that one for you. Thank you. To see. <laughs> Uh, lastly, on that topic, there are 41 employees who choose not to take the district's health insurance. So that is to our benefit, um, obviously, with that expense um, for each individual. So there are contractual obligations for us to provide them a stipend in lieu of that. Um, depending on the bargaining unit or the, um, uh, the group that they're in uh, determines what that buyout is. That 41 employees mentioned there, that's an increase of four from last year at that time, which does help us tremendously. Uh, the buyouts vary based on bargaining units, but range between $1,000 and $5,000 um, in total expense. However, it's important to note, and this is another place where contingencies have been built in, at qualifying times throughout the year, so there are, I believe, two different qualifying um, dates upon which people can identify changes to their health insurance. However, any material life change, getting married, having a child, um, would make another qualifying event for an individual. Any individual who's receiving health care or who is taking a buyout from the district may make a change to their health insurance premiums. Um, so as a result, we do need to build in contingencies for what happens when people shift. There are natural life events that occur when individuals get married. And we go from a single to a two person and from a two person to a family. Um, and for those who may be receiving coverage under a spouse um, or domestic partner who then switch to take uh, the edge one insurance. So embedded within this budget, our contingencies amounting to $236,000, which is 2.7% of our total health insurance budget. That's consistent. Uh, we've been between 2.5 and 3% on that contingency for each of the last three years. We often obviously hope that we don't need to um, actualize that. And I think as we spoke of last time, we do have some planned appropriations of fund balance. If these contingencies don't come to fruition, we wouldn't ultimately need to plan to actually utilize uh, those appropriations. Staying on the same path, since uh, Medicare expenses really does hit our health insurance um, obligations for many of those in retirement, if you flip to the Medicare tab, per contractual obligation, we reimburse retirees for the money that the federal government takes out of their Social Security checks each month. We estimate 170 retirees will be eligible for this benefit during the 24-25 school year which leads to a total expense of $772,000. On the Medicare reimbursement history summary that you'll see in your tab, <laughs> so we've seen a 27% increase in the number of living retirees over the last 10 years and a 65% increase over the last 20 years. So just the visual alone, I think, tells the story. Uh, we go back to the 2003-2004 budget with just over $100,000. This is very immaterial to the overall budget it has rapidly grown over the years to represent something that is a significant contribution uh, to the driver of the annual changes that we see. Obligations differ for each bargaining unit and they're often based on retirement date. For example, our ETA members retiring after June 30th of 2014 
They're reimbursed for Medicare Part B premiums paid only by the retiree, not the spouse, and only at the basic Medicare Part B premium level, as opposed to the income adjusted model, for which many of our current uh, retirees are grandfathered into. Many of the changes that the board has actively sought in negotiations over the map past, uh, I'd say two to three um, renegotiations with each unit, we will not see the effect of to any great extent for a number of years. Many of us may or may not be here at that time uh, because they are grandfathered in to um, specific dates and times. We do now have approximately five uh, retirees who are at these uh, more restrictive reimbursements um, that have been recently retired from the district. Um, that number will continue to grow, but with 177 on the books right now, they will still represent a very small group uh, until the tie terms get away. The 24 Medicare rates themselves uh, currently are in effect. They're on annual years, not our school fiscal year. So there's a 2024 rate and it'll change in 25. So we've accounted for the current rates for the first six months of 24. And we have estimated increases for what those rates might be in 25 for the last six months of the school year. The rates themselves have increased by 6% from last year. So I think in summary, if you put it all together, when the expenses are combined with the costs associated with retiree health insurance, um, we're set to spend $3.3 million on retiree health expenses next year. So when you look and start to break the budget apart, um, it's not just active employees, but of that $72 million budget, $3.3 million of that is actually allocated to the health insurance for our retirees, post-employment benefits of the district. That's about 4.6% of our overall operating budget. Moving to retirement, and I'm trying to go in decreasing order of magnitude. So the retirement represents 6% uh, of our overall operating budget. Um, all public school districts in New York must make employer contributions to the pension system. So TRS for teachers, employee retirement system for our other um, employees. We've been asked to budget 10.02%, uh, which is up about a quarter percent from last year for all teacher salaries, which is really teachers, administrators, teaching assistants, some coaches who qualify for uh, the teacher retirement system. Uh, the total budgeted amount for TRS is $3.1 million next year. That's a 7.5% increase or about $220,000 budget to budget. Next, it is important to note this though, next year's assumed rate is lower than the last 10 years average contribution rate. And I know we've had conversations about this in the past. Um, so I would look at this, unfortunately 10% is, is high um, in terms of overall magnitude of cost, but the 10 year average contribution is 11.1%. Um, so this would be in the 10 year period, a more favorable year um, than what we have seen in some past years. Um, if you do look at the retirement tab, you will see the historical um, employer contribution rates dating back to 2005-6 through 24-25. On the ERS, the employee retirement system side of things, we're seeing an increase from 13.1% to 15.5% of payroll. However, that's not really, the calculation is more specific than that. ERS will calculate our pension um, requirement based on what tier each individual is in, and they'll apply a contribution rate based on tier. So those rates for our employees will actually vary between 11.4 and almost 18% of their salaries. Uh, similar to TRS, our budget to budget increase in this area is $202,000 or 26% increase on last year. In total, our retirement benefits combined ERS and TRS are budgeted to increase by $425,000. That's 16% of the overall budget to budget increase. It sense a theme, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of these uh, facts, so health insurance, 25% um, of the overall increase, uh, retirement, um, pension contributions, 16% of the overall increase. That's 41% of the increase right there. <clears throat> Two other categories in the top part of that chart, the social security, which represents 4%. This is just um, straight calculation based. So changes to that employer contribution limits have resulted in an increase of $43,000 next year. Over the last two years, we've seen the limit upon which we must um, tax um, or make contributions increase drastically. 
in 22, the upper threshold was you were required to make contributions on the first $147,000 for employee. That jumped to 160 last year, and it's been increased next year to 168,000. So we're paying 7.65% of salaries up to that threshold. Anyone who earns more than that, it's capped. That's a fixed number. Um, but with that change, um, we've seen, uh, we're, we're experiencing about a $43,000 increase to our budget. As you'll see, the total costs in Social Security um, are just under $3 million at $2.9 million. And then lastly, the other benefits. This is a catch-all. It represents 2% of the budget. It includes funds for workers' compensation, disability insurance, unemployment insurance, life insurance premiums, welfare benefits, uh, and administrative fringe benefits. The proposed budget of $1,090,000 is 2.5% up from last year. It can best be explained by obligations related to those fringe benefits for administrators, including tuition reimbursements, 403B payments, and vacation buyouts. Overall, the line has remained incredibly steady over the past many years. If you actually look back on a six or seven year analysis, um, it's been very close to that million dollars. So in total, the proposed increase of 2.5 million in salary and benefits alone represents 91% of the overall budget to budget increase. So if we just take a baseline of last year and we come to this year, 91% uh, of that difference right there is explained in those lines that we just spoke of. So do, um, to ensure that there is fulsome engagement from all so that I don't lull you all into uh, the super, <laughs> take a chance to pause, ask any questions that the board may have as it relates to the personnel categories um, or the chart that you see below that, which kind of highlights the overall FDEs that we've seen um, each year, which has grown and um, I think had been refined a number of times. So if you look at last year's data on this, um, this is better. So if you see an inconsistency in a previous year, I think we've refined past years. Um, to expand on each of the categories. Questions? So I have a question, just for clarification purposes, because yep. you just said a whole lot. <laughs> we have a lot in here. Um, so in terms of the health insurance and um, retirement, well, retirement separate, health insurance, um, is this something that's so, like, what's the driving factor more? Is it more increasing the number of claims or is it just more of the cost of health insurance? And what are we, I mean, is this something that we're gonna keep anticipating and trying to find ways to, you know, try to work with? It's um, a great question. So I'm a non-voting member of Swiss Ship as well on the board. Um, there are representatives from each school district that's part of a consortium. So I am the uh, de facto elected individual to participate in that at our annual reorganization meeting. So I, I, the luxury of being able to sit in some of those conversations, uh, the primary driver is really twofold. So it is the increase in costs associated with some of the uh, prescription services, uh, that there are many prescribed medications where the cost has risen to a point that are really out of control. Um, I know that Swiss Chip and many other um, health providing organizations are doing their best to try to ensure that uh, there's equitable access to um, generic drugs as well. Uh, that would provide some relief there. The second driving force is really high claims from um, high cost individual claims, not increase in total number of claims per se, but that there are some real high cost claims that have come in that require them to balance their books. Um, I would not anticipate this to level off um, in the short term. Um, it seems more gloomy um, long term then it would be that this is a quick spike to kind of get to a plateau in the process. Um, it's something that was experiencing um, rapid growth annually. And in terms of retirement, I'm, has the number of retirements pretty much stayed consistent over the years? And what are we projecting to see in the next five years? Is that number going to in, in rise substantially? Like, what's the forecast on that? That's a, a great question. And, and a, uh, a little peek behind as to why that's really important, not just in terms of thinking about staffing and the impact um, and the effect in the budget, but as we think about retirees, um, when somebody retires from the district, um, we then have a post-employment retirement benefit for them. So um, if one individual retires, that's increasing the retirement pool who's eligible for benefits, but we have a replacement person who's coming on who will also be eligible for benefits. Um, so it doesn't, one doesn't offboard and to onboard the other. Um, we have not had a tremendous number of retirements in the last few years. Uh, we've only had a handful each of the last three. Um, we did receive and have already recognized two individuals as uh, part of the ETA 
who have submitted their um, retirement for the end of this year. I have no notice of any others um, to this date. We have done an analysis of um, where people are in their careers, um, eligibility for retirement per their, um, what, what could be determined to be like fully vested in the teacher retirement system. We have a um, tremendous wealth of experience in the district amongst our teaching staff uh, and other units as well. Um, not a ton that are really at that point, I think, ready to, to make that move though. Um, so there's a lot of experience, but not yet at that requirement eligibility. Set that one. Um, what that does mean is that there is likely to be a high number of retirements, maybe not in the next few years, but if you were to do a five, seven, or 10 year look, uh, where well, we might see a significant turnover at that time. Good to know. Thank you. And that happens in waves. Um, I think, you know, historically, if you look back in uh, the mid 2000s, there was a tremendous amount of turnover. And so similarly, many people came in at that time um, who are kind of working through their career now and will likely exit at similar time periods as well. Right. And the other element, presumably, in that area is that everybody's um, living longer. Correct. And so that is 100%. Mm -hmm. Not that that's a bad thing. No, that's great. But just it means that. Um, you know, so you're seeing the, the average age of our retirees um, is, is, sorry, the life expectancy of our retirees is increasing. Yeah. Um, so the, the number of years upon which uh, post-employment benefits affect the employee um, has gone up. And simultaneously, um, there has been a general trend in retirement at earlier ages. And so when you add those two together, that pool who, who fall into that post-employment benefit um, is just is increased on both ends, um, both when they first activate it and um, their life expectancy. So I have a quick question. On, I know we've talked about this in the past. Um, are the, I guess it's a two-part question. One, do we have an understanding of our particular claims in terms of um, our impact on the overall and are you seeing in, I know there's a bunch of self-insured districts, are we seeing self-insured districts experience the same type of increase? Um, potentially more. Our claims disaggregated completely, no. Um, I'm sure that we could obtain mm -hmm. uh, that information, but I have not seen it, it presented that way. The Although to be fair, like it takes one. Correct. Really yeah. <laughs> big claim and it all unraveled and pretty it, quickly. Ultimately, the buying power of being in a consortium yeah. is what we are. Um, so when you speak to self-insured, so as a small district, certainly we gain um, a whole scale of magnitude by by joining with all of the other um, school districts that are represented by Swiss Chip, which, which provides us uh, some smoothing of the effects annually, um, year over year. I do know of a few districts, I won't mention by name, but who uh, heard contributing um, information from who are self-insured where they're experiencing similar challenges. And because when you're self-insured, you, you are it's far more volatile. Um, one individual, a few individuals who have high costs, that, that makes a, a huge change um, to what the district's uh, liability is in any given year. So they really have to do mm -hmm. an analysis of their own fund balance and, and plan for that. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay. Okay. Great. So if we now flip to the four-year budget summary by category sheet. Um, so again, I'm trying to try to dedicate the time to the areas which is the largest percent. So we've talked about the largest percent there. Um, the highlighted categories that you see here are just ones that I'll draw your attention to that we haven't really unpacked to any great extent. They don't require nearly as much um, background or research, but um, in many instances, they do represent a, a large delta, either on the dollar or by the percent um, change. Um, you'll notice that it's organized by function code on the left-hand side. Those are the state-determined function codes that kind of break into departments and categories for us. Uh, the first I'll bring forward, I, I want to actually pair together, uh, the 1240 and 1430 codes. So that's the chief school administrator um, and then the personnel line. Uh, so the chief school administrator, it's a category that contains all the expenses associated with the office of the superintendent. Next year's allocation of $429,000 is 25% less uh, than the current year. I don't want that to be misconstrued and that there's not support in that way. This is really the reallocation of funds and targeted to personnel and human resource related activities. Um, so with the um, approval of Dr. Moselli as our new director of human resources, we have allocated money on a separate budget line that is new to us. And those are all the codes that fall under the 1430 um, function code. 
Um, so in that is a shift of salaries related to some of the clerical support staff that were functioning in human resource activities under the superintendent to the personnel line, um, as well as the cost for memberships, conferences, travel, um, associations that we're um, a part of uh, that assist in the human resource activities of the district. Also, you'll see obviously an increase on the personnel uh, line to $277,305. Um, which last year we had no budgetary allocation for. So contained in that line is the salary for the Director of Human Resource, uh, clerical support, and those aforementioned memberships, uh, supplies, equipment, materials necessary to run that office. Mm -hmm. Operation of plant, the 1620 code, that's the naming convention of the state really just for facilities, buildings and grounds. Um, and so I think a really important one for us to look at is it represents a significant part of our budget. Uh, we are planning to, um, we are allocating a budget of $5,054,630 next year, uh, which you'll note is a decrease of 1.8% um, year over year. That's great news. Last year at this time, we presented a significant increase. Um, and the volatility that you see in that line is really utility dependent. Mm. Um, so of the $5 million, $2.6 million is accounted for in salaries. The remaining $2.4 million 30% of that is utility expenses that we're going to. Um, contained in your binders is a tab for utilities. And on that sheet, you'll see a five year utility history that displays actual or the anticipated expenditures each of the last four years, along with our proposed budget. Although it's not a great benchmark to use the 2021 school year, um, as given that we were operating under a half hybrid, half um, in-person session at the time, we spent a mere $483,000 on utilities in that year. Our anticipated expense next year is 51% higher than that and is due to considerable increases in the per unit expense for electricity. Namely, a 9% increase in 2024 and an anticipated 6% increase in 2025. Now, that can be a little misleading if you look at what we're allocating in our budget compared to last year. Although, and I spoke to this last week, although we're seeing significant increases in the, per, uh, in the usage rate that's being applied to us, um, we've also found ways to mitigate that um, through a number of measures in the district. One of which being considerable savings from uh, the electrical usage reduction efforts that um, uh, Ray Renda has implemented with his staff, replacing light bulbs district wide, which has been better than expected, I would say. Um, we knew it was going to make an immediate impact. We always talk about that um, inflection point. When do we break even? I think we're probably there already um, because of how much savings that we're yielding right now. Uh, the fact that it was producing such a reduction forced us to expand that, not just at the high school, to the elementary schools as well. I'm going to give them a lot of credit for doing so. Uh, the, the second area that you'll see a fairly considerable reduction is in oil prices. Again, we have to make projections on this. We, at the time of budget development last year, we were projecting really high costs, and they've been relatively stable and pretty low um, comparably through the winter season for us this year, which has kept costs down pretty significantly. Uh, and then lastly, I would say it's um, improvements in the management of our heating systems. So through our activity last year, when we were really looking at the impact of utility expenses, um, Ray had looked at the, the way that um, the heating systems are being operated for schools. Um, some schools have multiple operational systems and use um, natural gas and or um, oil. And the way in which we utilize those has been controlled. We also looked at the uh, utilization of, of windows, doors, and how that was impacting um, the expense associated with heating and, and have come to a more um, steady place to, to keep those costs down. Lastly, the function code contains $400,000 that are allocated for district-wide building improvements. Over the past many years, this allocation has assisted in the construction of a number of small projects in the district, including the EHS library classroom, the EHS cafeteria classroom, bathroom upgrades, and floor replacement projects. Um, with a successful bond vote in May, it's my hope that this is one of the lines that we'll be able to reduce um, in the future for a number of reasons. One, we anticipate um, additional debt service that we'd want to offset 
to reduce the impact on taxpayers. And two, there's a lot to do with that bond, that there's not going to be a lot of time, space, um, or capacity for many of those smaller projects. We hope to have captured a significant number in the bond, um, and we'll let that be the mechanism by which we're doing much of that work. Uh, next line I draw your attention to is the unallocated insurance line. Um, so after a 6.8% decrease in the current year's budget, our ex planned expenditures in this area are set to increase by almost 6%, uh, bringing us kind of back to where we were. Actual costs are not yet available as we're in the renewal process. So each year around this time, we're completing a number of forms for our um, insurance providers who then shop for the best rates we can possibly yield. Um, but recent years data will suggest that some of those policies, in particular cybersecurity insurance, uh, will continue to increase at a rate that's in excess of our other holdings. Um, I think the, the liability associated with it continues to grow. Less and less carriers are willing to take on school districts uh, or public institutions. And when you have less competition, rates tend to rise. Uh, with increased opportunities uh, for travel for our students as well, uh, namely we've had two trips this year and one last year, uh, we have purchased additional um, supplemental foreign travel insurance to protect our staff members um, and provide some additional insurances for us. Uh, we have built that into the budget as well this year, which wasn't otherwise in the budget past year. Uh, function code 1964, the refund on real property taxes. This is a, a really important one for us to look at longitudinally. Historically, we've budgeted between two hundred and three hundred thousand dollars in this line uh, for unexpected tertiary refunds that are not currently targeted in the tertiary reserve. In two um, of the last three years, we were able to make sizable transfers to the tertiary reserve at year's end, while also closing out past year's obligations. That leaves us with a fund balance in our tertiary reserve of $5.4 million, and we have exposures of approximately $12.8 million. So if you do a um, reserve to exposure ratio, we're at about 42%. So that, that's really good. Um, that exceeds the typical settlement rates that, that we're negotiating uh, for the cases that we've been recently engaged in. And as a result of our standing in that area, I've zeroed out this line. I don't think it um, is necessary for us to build that $100,000, which you've seen we've kind of reduced year over year um, into next year's budget. <laughs> Similarly, as I stated at our last meeting, I expect a surplus at the end of this year. And so I believe there'll be opportunities to um, target funds from this year's uh, surpluses to the tertiary fund next year, uh, making this budget line, I guess, less consequential to reduce. Mm -hmm. Two more categories. Uh, so 5510 and 5540 are lumped together. The uh, transportation services. So just for the history again, four years ago, we proposed a budget that anticipated expenditures in the transportation area to increase by 40% budget to budget. As a result, it was asked, uh, the, dis the um, district was asked to pursue and look at other opportunities um, that might present more favorable bids um, than what were received by the district. Uh, as a result, we did choose to join a transportation consortium made up of four local school districts that's managed by the Ardsley Union Free School District. And because of that, we've yielded considerable savings annually, some of which are easily measurable year one. Some of them are assumed. Um, we don't have a ton of purchasing power as a district. We don't operate or we don't provide in-district busing. We provide only uh, busing for special education placements, private and parochial school placements um, by parents. That represents uh, no more than 90 students uh, at a time. That doesn't provide um, a lot of vendors a, a great sense of um, uh, scale magnitude for, for their bids. And so we tend to get very few bids back. Um, we have seen our expenses increase annually, uh, some of which through negotiations uh, that have been had with the respective bidders as part of the consortium, others as renegotiations permissible at the CPI um, calculated in May. So we do anticipate CPI to be around 4% by May 1st, hopefully lower. Um, so we have budgeted a 4% increase on those bus allocations for next year. Um, but in addition to that, um, we are not seeing a significant reduction in the overall number of students we anticipate transporting. 
If you look at the transportation tab, you'll see that in the current year, we're transporting 88 students. And again, if you follow from the bottom of the document, work your way up. We had one year where we were at 87, 84, but for the past five or six years before this, we were transporting between 60 and 75 students. Um, of those 88 students, um, only six are anticipated to graduate this year. It does not mean all 82 remaining will request transportation services for next year, but the current um, applications that we receive suggest that we will be transporting more students, not less, next year. When you couple the 4% increase or anticipated increase plus additional ridership, um, we have really no other way to um, anticipate that these expenses would not rise rather sharply. Uh, the other component that's included in here um, is a management fee. So as part of the consortium, um, Ardsley Transportation does provide a transportation manager uh, for our services in the district. Um, each year they have increased the rates associated with that. Although I should say we have one year we had a reduction. Um, next year's proposed management fee is at an increase of 4.12%, which was the CPI um, utilized in the tax cap calculation um, back at the 12 months ending in January. Um, also included in there are comments that were made by all the principals. I think that they've talked a lot about this in regard with regard to the building-based transportation needs, um, increased opportunities for field trips and experiences for students, and often the need to utilize coach buses um, due to a lack of drivers or buses available that meet our time frame, uh, which does significantly increase the overall cost of those trips. We certainly don't have firm numbers on this. This is always one of the areas that we have to estimate. In fact, you'll see um, our planned expenditures in the current year are likely to exceed uh, what we budgeted last year. We obviously don't hope to ever be on that side of it, but um, we do know we have other areas where we have surpluses that <clears throat> overcome that difference. And then if you flip to the back page, there are two groupings we already talked about tonight. Those are the retirement systems and the health uh, reimbursements. Uh, the last one I talk about and draw your attention to is the transfer to capital. This represents 2.8% of the overall budget. And although we've discussed this one previously, I do think it's important just to summarize the proposed transfers, uh, given the significance of the action. So for next year, we're proposing a transfer from the general fund to the capital fund, uh, totaling $2,090,000 to support anticipated expenditures from the capital fund in the next school year. The $2 million proposed transfer has been generated off of estimated expenditures for projects that do include $350,000 for the EHS auditorium project, uh, which we hope when matched by the Edgemont uh, School Foundation in their uh, fundraising efforts should provide the necessary funding for the renovations this summer. About $1.3 million for the replacement and repairs of the Greenville APR roof, ductwork, and gutters. And I know that's a big number to just categorize as roof, ductwork, and gutters. Um, but it's a lot of remediation, uh, water damage issues, longstanding issues that need to be addressed there um, that do come at a considerable estimated cost. Um, we don't have firm costs for these. These are architect um, uh, generated estimates based on similar work, cost per square foot. Um, and then lastly, $375,000 for the first phase of the junior senior high school paving project um, to begin the process for updating um, the roads, parking lots, um, sidewalks, et cetera, um, that exist on campus that are in many cases in need of significant repair. The net effect of this transfer, when you consider last year's transfer to capital and the debt service schedule, which we've been kind of lumping as two um, critical components, is a decrease of $348,000 year over year. And then I think Dr. Hamilton mentioned this, and, and this will be one of the last things that I'll draw your attention to before opening for questions. Without making such a significant commitment to the capital work um, in the form of transfers to capital, while not being able to assume new debt service um, when our previous bond debt service rolled off, um, we would have experienced wild swings um, in the overall tax levy year over year. Um, simultaneously, failing to capture the rolling off debt presented a significant lost opportunity to address our aging and deteriorating infrastructure and so we were able to accomplish two goals, immediate investment into critical projects that were necessary in the district while trying to maintain a more smooth um, tax rate increase or tax levy increase to the community. 
Um, so we considered that a necessary pivot when we were unable to perform the capital bond plans. Um, lastly, the transfers to the capital um, fund, they do require voter authorization, but not a separate proposition. So unlike use from the capital reserve, which get very confusing here, the reserve requires voter authorization by proposition to establish it and then to take money out of it. We are not seeking voter authorization to take money out of that this year. The capital fund is just one of the funds that we maintain, school lunch fund, a general fund, a special aid fund, capital fund. Um, and um, the transfers that are presented on the budget lines by the passing of the budget provides the authority for that transfer to occur. Uh, so no separate action is necessary, but it is important to um, identify what transfers are anticipated to be presented. I have just one document that I think summarizes, if you just pass it down. Um, I think the board's goal of smoothing the tax levy increase year over year. Wait for it to slow down. Um, not perfect estimates, but uh, think of this as a simulation. Mm -hmm. So I went back 21, 22 um, would have been the last year that we paid debt service on our old bonds that have now rolled off. The column that you see to the far right was the actual tax levy increase that was applied that year. So in 21, 22, the actual levy increase was 1.72%. We added a column to the left of that, which is what would the levy be if we had if we had not performed these capital transfers in the 23-24 or the proposed transfers for next year, 24-25, and then I'll bring it out one more year to 25-26. If you follow the actual levy increases, 172, 169, 341 in the current year, we're proposing a 395 for next year. And I'm doing an estimation based on many of the things we've talked about in our finance um, subcommittee, that very rough estimate um, for 25, 26, under the plan as constituted would be about 3.65%. If we had not made those transfers to capital um, and had significantly reduced our maximum allowable tax levy, in the 23, 24 school year last year, we would have sought a reduction in the tax levy of just under one, just about 1%. The current year, we would have gone up to 4.69%, and I would anticipate in the 25-26 year about a 6% increase. I don't want to go keep going too far, but I'll share with you to go one more year out, 26-27. Um, again, those estimations become less reliable, but we're looking at maybe an 8% um, increase on that. And I think one of the goals the board has had always adopted was the attempt to try to smooth the impact so that the annual effect year over year was not as impactful. Um, if you look at it this way, the overall expenditure um, maybe the same. If we were to tackle those projects at a later time, the cost is going to be generated on, in either instance. However, by smoothing that rate out, we've been able to also accomplish work earlier than we would be able to do so in the, in the bond. And we're preparing ourselves to be able to take a step into new debt service um, that will not have the same impact. At the same time, um, although we are making the recommendation to go to the maximum allowable tax levy this year, this being one of the reasons, choosing to not do so will make this more volatile. Um, there is a strong likelihood in the 26-27 school year where we may make the recommendation not to. Um, we have reserves that we have um, are well positioned to help assist us in that year. 26-27, if the bond is passed um, and we bring on debt in the way that we would plan to as of today, would be the year where we bring on a sizable amount of debt service without yielding that same sizable return in state aid. That's the swing year where we're going to see a greater impact um, and where it would be really valuable for us to be able to um, appropriate reserves to ensure that that impact is not so drastic. So it is a multi-year um, plan and trying to meet that goal of trying to smooth that levy to the extent that we can. And then uh, lastly, unless you had asked a question at the last meeting, and so just to provide some uh, follow-up to that, you'd asked to break down the other category, which was on a slide presented called non-personnel related expenditures. 
Uh, the category had comprised about $3.5 million of the proposed budget. And so just to kind of give a highlight of what's in there, because that is a big amount of money. Um, so it's a bunch of littles that add up. So textbooks, workbooks, consumable supplies, equipment, furniture, memberships, conference attendance and travel reimbursement, consultant expenses, which is actually pretty considerable. Um, legal expenses, also a, a pretty considerable one. All the expenses associated with our required audits. Um, subscriptions and services, our public relations um, contracts, and then the BOCES administrative and capital costs, which is actually probably um, a little more than 10% of that overall. Uh, and so that's kind of a mixed bag of, of um, items that we do have greater control over. You can uh, choose to buy less furniture, buy less materials, um, but not significant enough individually to create your own category. That's the overarching um, general spiel. I appreciate your patience with me as we work through that. Um, I'd like to open up for any questions on any of those areas we've highlighted um, or any broad questions. Obviously, if you have questions that um, can be or need to be redirected to an individual department, we have all of the department heads, principals um, here to assist us with that. Pass it to you. Okay. Take us off, Jennifer. All right. right. Well, first of all, I appreciate you um, providing this color in terms of, we've talked a lot about what's smoothing, but to, to show with some numbers, albeit estimates, what that actually means in terms of what we're doing and what the impact would be if we didn't. Um, I have a small question for Ray, and it feels like I'm nitpicking because his budget line has actually gone down, but I guess you're a victim of your success. <laughs> um, you know, you brought costs down successfully by, by changing light bulbs. You, you uh, reallocated stuff with the, with the furnaces. Do you have anything in mind about other areas to look where maybe some of these energy costs can be controlled? Uh, well, I, I believe once we uh, put in our new system with the bond, we'll be able to control things considerably better, such as building management system, individual cash and set points can be adjusted to daytime occupied set points to nighttime setback set points. So we have better control over the systems in that respect. So doing the bond is actually going to help us in certain areas. Yeah, no doubt. Certainly an additional carrying cost or adding air conditioning gets required is going to cost more money. We know that. Like specifically what Ray is speaking to is that included in that is a whole district like uh, management system. Like think of it as like the brains of the, um, or like your smart devices that you have in your house to control your um, environment. So it would give greater control over that um, and, and help us mitigate some of that additional expenses. Um, we've also talked, I think there's been a number of recommendations at many of the forums to look at alternative um, resources, ways that we can reduce our footprint, whether it be installation of solar panels or looking at other alternatives that can kind of offset the increase. That's something we'll absolutely be looking at um, in the coming years. We do have an energy performance contract that we'll be rolling off in a few years as well. We can look at it through that avenue um, as well as others. Great, good to know. Thank you. Two questions. Go ahead. Um, the first is just, again, just for clarification slash reminder, um, when it comes to the line on refund of real property taxes, how is that exposure, tertiary exposure calculated? I think it was 12 million or so. Yeah, so great question. So we we do engage a tertiary council, um, attorney who is specifically doing that as the work of the district. So um, analyzing all of the uh, small claims assessments, which actually doesn't feed into the tertiary. Mm -hmm. So it would be individual homeowners generally who are looking or seeking tax reduction. And then uh, tertiary doesn't always mean corporate, but it is typically um, the uh, business. businesses and yeah. associations and that yeah. own properties in the district who are seeking um, refunds on that. Um, so the analysis is performed to identify what the actual assessment value is. Um, based on the claims that have been submitted, there's a calculation to determine what the, uh, if any assessment reduction would be awarded, if it was to go to um, either a negotiation or settlement agreement or to trial. And that's done based on actual examination of the individual properties, uh, looking at comps for others that the town may have renegotiated with, um, or assessments that were recently done, as well as looking outside of Greenberg, and then also applying kind of the logic in terms of 
uh, what have typical settlement rates look like for similar cases in the past uh, to determine what that overall exposure could be. Um, our council does a pretty fantastic job of that. Um, and the documentation that he provides me is is been really solid over the last few years. So this isn't, it's based on actual claim mm -hmm. or pursuing a claim. So each okay. year, um, so there is a set date and right. escapes me at the moment as to when these must be filed. Uh, and there are a number of reasons as to why a claim could be considered. Mm -hmm. um, and so in many cases, many of these local businesses do file every year uh, because if they do not, right. then they lose the opportunity to claim that year. Um, so then once everything has been submitted, it's all organized and identified that claims were made on each of these years mm -hmm. so that we determine what our exposure could be um, to help us kind of plan for how much we may need if they were to go um, to settlement agreement or trial. Okay. Should I ask my second? Or yeah, oh, go. Okay. Um, so Ray is a very popular person tonight. I have <laughs> another question for you. Um, again, just clarifying. When it comes to the transportation costs on 5510 and 5540, I'm just curious as to how those two buses behind the gym factor into that cost, whether those buses are fully utilized or if there are other things that we could be purposing them for. Great question. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Ray. <laughs> the buses roll during the day, they roll in the evening, they get a bus, they get a transportation, we will pay school. We also children students the robotics competition, the older, the skill. So they're in here. The cost associated with the drivers and okay, okay. And are they part of the consortium or are those separate as our own private property? Separate. Okay. Okay. So okay. It's a great question. It's actually really timely. We've had a lot of conversations recently about it um, and we've been exploring how we, if there's any way we can utilize it to help us in some of those areas. Mm -hmm. um, just for a point of clarification, the expenses, in, and we're actually going to reallocate them next year, Ray and I just had this conversation last week. Um, right now, we have two um, custodial maintenance staff members who have their CDL license who are doing the driving for us. Okay. Um, the expenses associated with their costs are not seen in the 5510 and 5540 right now. Typically, it's either overtime if it's outside of their contractual time, or and sometimes it's just during their shift when, when they've been assigned this um, task. Those expenses would actually be represented in the 1620 um, salary codes mm -hmm. currently. However, we made the determination that given um, we're utilizing the buses uh, way beyond what we had ever done in the past, um, I do believe it's important to track that expense. And so we're going to charge the salary, additional salaries expended on that next year uh, to that 5540 code um, by creating another salary line there. Um, there are stipends for those who are our, our bus drivers. That's in the 5540, but the actual, any additional work that you're working on the weekends, driving, um, or outside of their typical shifts. Uh, Ray tracks all of this in his office. The spreadsheet's pretty incredible, the number of trips it's taken this year. Um, it's it's a daily occurrence at, at this point. Yeah, so, so you can go to these two, three, three, four hours over time, it goes in thousands of dollars, right? mm -hmm. plus, mm -hmm. thousand dollars plus, mm -hmm. we would rather three, four hours over time, and now it's significant. Right. No. And yeah, just figuring out if, well, not for today's discussion, but if, if we've hit the sweet spot with two of them, yep. right? Or if the sweet spot is at four of them, depending on what other kinds of consortium related trips we're paying for that don't really require those big full coach experiences. Yeah. And I would say right now, it, um, the buses would be less the concern, but more staffing yeah. to make exactly. sure that um, they could both be able to fill the duties, mm -hmm. the primary duty, and then this is a secondary. Um, it is an important conversation for us to look at as it relates to electric vehicle uh, bus initiatives. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, we have less of a it feels like less pressure on, on us as we don't have in district busing right now. Um, but as it currently stands, by 2030, any new purchase um, needs to be a, a zero emission bus. Mm -hmm. uh, and by 2035 or 36, I forget which year, any buses that are in service need to comply with that. Mm -hmm. So we've got plenty of time to make that determination, but it is more likely than not the next bus that we buy is going to be likely a zero emission bus. 
um, and in doing so requires infrastructure, right? It, it requires charging stations and separate power and, and um, a number of other things to explore. Um, we are, we have the, the most recent conversation we had was really in relation to our consortium and trying to see, can we solve some of the logistical problems in the consortium with the use of our own bus mm -hmm. at certain times? And the conclusion we've drawn, I think this is a, a good one, is that they're being used so much right now that we actually, we couldn't um, yeah. pull them into the consortium to assist, yeah. um, which is, means that we're really maximizing our current usage. Okay. Thank you. No, I... We're good? Good. Good. I had a um, clarifying question. Um, <clears throat> in the enrollment tab, we have different numbers and projections on the enrollment, but like when we had the presentations, you know, a few weeks ago, we had the numbers are differing. I think the difference was, I don't know where my math went. But yeah. So 1853 versus 1818. Total of yep. No, I think it's a great question. So yeah. I think there's a couple of different models that I provided for your packet. The 1853 is current, so that's Fed's day. That was October 15 this year. Yeah. Uh, so that's our snapshot, our annual snapshot. The two proposals or two simulations that you'll see uh, project enrollment in your packet. One of them is through comparative analytics, which is basically software that we subscribe to. Um, that is more up to date than the demographic study, but I would say it is a less reliable source than the demographic study. Uh, the demographic study was done two years ago, and if you use their estimations um, for next year, it assumes that we'll be higher next year than we are in our current. But that fails to recognize that we have 50 plus less students this year than they had assumed mm -hmm. at the time of their study. So if, if you were just to take those 50 students off, it gets us close to where the forecast five analysis is. Okay. Okay. Um, that comparative analytics forecast five by another name um, is with the new data put in for this year is pushing out on the backside of that simulation 1,802 students, which if you look at, I'll give you that color coded one that looks like steps. Yeah. Yeah. This one's in here as well. Oh, no, no, no. We don't no. have that one. Oh, sure. Wait, picture we're looking at just now. Oh, I, I, oh, I have this one we have. Yeah. Oh, I have. It's, not, it's not the colored one, though. Yeah. Not that if you one. go a few pages in this this one here i think i see it in jennifer's yeah it it makes some sense right if you do the, the most crude analysis is how many graduating seniors do you have and how many anticipated kindergarten students do you have um, if the trends seem to hold with kindergarten at around 100 students coming in and we have graduating 149 students then we've got a, a net loss of approximately 50 students and all others held the same. And that gets us down to roughly 1,800 students. Okay. So you're correct. It is presented in a few different ways and it's um, based on two different analysis. So you're relying more on the demographic study than the other source? I think that the, the um, methodology employed by the demographic study is, is of greater reliance but we already know after one year, their estimates are above what we a little yielded. Off, right. so we've got to do some adjustment to that. Um, if we were to give them the same data, I think that they would assume 50 less students next year from what they're doing this adjustment. So I just, let me just follow up on that because the thing about the demographic study, which I think is is helpful, is it, it helps you understand kind of who's currently and about to enter the school, though I think that I have a kindergarten class on my block. But <laughs> the, the the challenge with it is that we still have the same number of houses. So I mean, I think that there is definitely, you know, this year we're seeing a little bit of an uptick in real estate activity. You know, there's definitely exposure for us, regardless of what the demographic studies says. And so, you know, look at the high school level, we know we're not likely to go from a class of 75 students in both elementary schools to a class of 200 when by the time they get to the high school having said that you know those numbers could certainly could increase and the number of years that we're going to have 70 students in elementary in kindergarten is going to is not necessarily going to continue endlessly so i you know demographic studies as we've said are great for a couple years out but then you go further and you know they become less and less accurate and you know if you walk around the streets right now 
the stroller brigade is strong, um, which is great. And I, and I, it's, it's lovely to see a lot of young families moving into the area. So, um, so I think that that's, you know, I guess we'll see, it's kind of like a mystery every year, but I have a feeling that that number might start to tick up a little bit in the, in the short term. Um, I have three questions. Well, really there are only two, you know, the, the, um, we still have a couple of unknowns, right? We have a, the unknown of transportation, right? And who's gonna sign up for transportation? And I wanna ask a question about that separately, actually, so I have three questions. Um, and then we have the unknown about um, about real estate aid, right? So the legislative budget came through at, you know, at hold harmless and, you know, and 3%, um, you know, the, I'm not sure what the governor's budget was based on, based on slash and destroy but so we have those two budgets we may end up with somewhere in between we may end up you know last time this happened we ended up at the legislative budget so i guess the question is if we end up at the legislative budget and i did some analysis somewhere but i'm not gonna be able to find it right now i think it's like you know another four hundred and eighty thousand dollars or something of that sort so how would you adjust what we have today for that change? Hopefully we'll get that information. Hopefully both of these pieces of information will come April 1st. How would you change what we have today um, in terms of kind of our, our revenue projections and, and or expenses? Perfect question. So I, I am hopeful and I think- I think you've been working on it all day. When we, when we <laughs> talked about the, um, the revenue streams previously, I, I had said at the time, um, I, I felt as though part of it was posturing. Um, it's, it's like a negotiation. Set set the proposal at this. We knew where the legislative body was going to come in. We'll find some middle ground between the two. And what I had hoped for is that we'd at least be held harmless, that we'd get the same amount of foundation aid um, as we did this year. Um, you're correct. I think we're, I'd have to look right now, somewhere around between. It's just foundation, right? That's the only correct. one they're talking about. I, I'd say around $400,000 yeah. difference if we were to get both the health harmless back and the 3% um, CPI adjustment to the foundation, which has historically been the case. Um, this year's that question, answer to your question is easier this year than most. There are not things in the budget that, although we certainly put the administrative team through the rounds to get where we are, there's not something in the budget that we had to cut um, that is a result of foundation. Um, it is based on need and demonstrated rationale before that in, in the district. So because we are planning to appropriate $1.44 million um, as part of the revenue streams, we would short that um, planned appropriation of ERS by the amount that would be increased in state aid. Um, so I'm hopeful that we will have an opportunity to relook at this document as we, if we get um, a legislative proposal, or if that money flows to us in the future, it, it's again, less of a planned yeah. appropriation that we would need. Um, I would keep the million dollars in the appropriated fund balance as planned from surplus this year um, and try to maintain our reserves um, to the extent that we can. So what if we decided to actually put that money to work? Like what uh, you mentioned that we didn't have a lot of things, but there must've been something that got caught in the, in the kind of budget defense rounds that, um, there's plenty of things we could spend money on, but that that you think might be the would be the priority if we decided to use that money. Sure, be unfair for me to answer that. Uh, <laughs> um, I think we would need uh, who wins. Who wins? <laughs> I, I think that there are uh, each individual out there may have something that they um, would prioritize. I think some of it would be staffing related requests yeah. um, to support programs mm. um, that we don't currently have. Not not to continue the support of programs that exist, um, but I think given the the direct impact on students that staffing has. Um, that probably be an area where we would um, put the greatest amount of attention to uh, without naming yeah. each individual points, yeah. separately. Yeah. But we would certainly need to go through that activity if, if we wanted to expand upon um, the expenditures, um, looking at a prioritization of those things that were near the top of the list. Something that uh, came up last year that did not survive budget defense rounds and did not survive this year, mm -hmm. um, but I certainly understand the complexity of our students and what they, uh, how our, some of our students present. Uh, there has been a request for social work, mm -hmm. social worker um, to be added to our org chart. Uh, and I could see, and I want to be very careful because I want to say that if we got this money, we're going to add that. But mm -hmm. yeah, to Brian's yeah. point, you know, we, we have to be uh, responsible um, long term. 
but that is in terms of personnel, that is a position that um, has not survived uh, the budget defense rounds over the last two years. Mm -hmm. And now that Dr. Helm has named it, that would probably be the first one that I would I would name as well. Um, I think both impact related and I think rationale for how it may aid us um, in the reduction of additional services. Oh. Um, so there may be some offset as it relates to that, um, that, that could be beneficial. Um, I think the one challenge that we look at when we talk about salaries is you look at financial cliffs. So is is the foundation is sustainable? Is it, um, or does this become again a one-time thing and each year we're back and forth with what the budget looks like? Um, sometimes the salaries are difficult to make those commitments to yep. if you can't ensure long-term stability um, of that same. But that would have been the first one that popped into mind. Mm -hmm. It was the first one. Well, I mean, the, that begs the question, like, when do you ever feel comfortable enough to add something that's not required, right? Yep. And so I think that, you know, at some point it becomes either something that we feel like is required or or there is some offset in the back that your expectations are in the back end that, that will kind of support something like and that. And there are some mandates uh, put upon school districts that are not supported by by the state, like some? educating. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, ones uh, specifically is that comes to mind is just the education of uh, uh, students till age 20, certain students until mm -hmm. age 22. Uh, has has an impact, significant impact. Yeah. Uh, Direct impact on our proposal for next year. For absolutely. Sure. So and that, sure. that, that's one in particular. Great. Um, on the tra just to follow up on the transportation piece, um, you know, I know every we moved to the consortium and kind of what I looked at, it, you know, I remember years ago we were talking about fifteen thousand dollars a kid. It looks like we're down to like less than ten thousand dollars a kid, which is really great. I guess the question I have is um we say that, you know, we say that 88 people have signed up. Are these people using this every day? Do we take attendance? Do we have any idea what the usage is? Uh, yeah, I keep saying great question. Everyone's, uh, it's almost like we've, we've thought about these in advance, but it has not been the case for anyone who's out there. Um, so I, I have asked. Sorry, we should have sent all these to you. No, 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 this is perfect. Um, last week I sent an email to our transportation manager requesting that. Um, it has come to light just recently through happenstance for some of the routes, uh, namely that the manager had to drive the bus himself uh, because of driver shortage mm. and was able to report back that there are not, you know, you may have uh, six students registered, but only one was there. So I don't know if that's a, a long pattern or if it's a one time. Mm -hmm. um, and so I have asked them to come up with, and they have to work with the provider that they, they outsource much of this to Royal Coach. Uh, to come up with a mechanism for taking regular attendance and being able to report that to the district. Um, there, in conversations with many parents as well, there are some parents who are hesitant to um, sign up for transportation services because they don't want to uh, create, this is a wonderful uh, approach, Absolutely. they don't want to uh, create an additional expense to the district if they're not gonna utilize it. Um, at the same time, we will encourage them in, if, if your child, if you do anticipate to use the service, you need to apply by April 1st, hard, hard right. cutoff. Um, but we have informed some of them that if they are to apply and ultimately the services or the times or things just don't work out for them, that they're not utilizing it, they can certainly rescind that at a later date and say, you know, we, we forego our, our um, uh, availability of busing this year. And that would allow us to communicate that with our transportation manager. They'd be able to um, then going forward, reallocate the percentage of the bus that we're paying for um, versus others. And I think, you know, having... Um, our attendance reports and that would really help us make determinations in terms of uh, what type of busing services we can offer. Yeah. Many of our buses, we're, we're using common pickup points, you know, many <laughs> different students in the district and maybe shared with three or four districts. In order to make the times work, we typically use two points, either Greenville or, or the junior senior high school. Um, in some cases, if, if ridership is not high, then they change the way that we're able to distribute mm -hmm. the buses in the district as well. Um, and so it is something we're looking for more data on. I think it will both help us um, with the control of costs, but I think it'll also help improve the service as well. I just wanted to Can I? Oh, sorry. I was, I was going to say, I was going to be implying that like it's a lot more variable data in the afternoon. Than, like, mm. I don't know yet. Yeah. It seems likely. Like, I, yeah. Yes. Is there, and I was going to ask about afternoon because schools, you know, with after school activities, you know, a lot of times you take the bus, so you, you're, parent has to pick you up. Right. Is there an option for parents to do like half service or is it all or nothing if they anticipate kids wanting to be on an athletic team or something like that? 
So in, a parent could withdraw their child from a group at any time, and we could reallocate the distribution. Um, it's more complicated than that in terms of how they build the roots. So for example, when we were looking at a very specific route recently that brought up the question with Ray about our own buses and how we might be able to use that to help, um, we don't have a, a tremendous solution for the current year. We believe we have a better plan for next year. Um, if we were to sit, say to the consortium that we want our own bus, allocate a bus, Edgemont only, do not make trips to the other four districts, uh, we think we have enough students and we'll take the full cost of that. They have to pair that with an afternoon bus. Mm -hmm. So it, it it's, um, you know, they have an employee who needs a route on both ends of that. What we're paying for is the bus on both ends of it. So it almost doesn't matter if they're not there or not, if it's all our students. Mm -hmm. um, it matters if it's a shared ridership. So if in the morning we have 50% of the students, we're paying 50% of the bus. If the afternoon we only have 25%, we're only paying 25%. So knowledge of a desire not to use the afternoon service would be helpful to us because we'd be able to more appropriately um, make the expense correspond to the number of students who are taking it. And if that changed, like if we get back, because some of it's about experience, right? Like you don't really know, you can predict, then you don't really know when you get there. So if we, if somebody came in in September and said, you know what, I'm actually not going to use the morning at all because my kid's not getting up early enough for the bus, so I'm going to use the app, but I'll use the afternoon or vice versa. They can change that at any time. And we get we get that adjustment in our... Yeah. Okay. So we they would adjust ridership. So we get a monthly, you know, each bill is broken down by the actual number of scheduled riders per trip divided right. by the total expense of the bus, and that's how they calculate um, our contribution. Um, we, we have not had that in the past. I think that's, I'd like to see us move that way. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't mean that if somebody applied April 1st and then they said, you know what, I don't need the bus service, if they then wanted to come back on it, we'd have to put them back on. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it would be certainly a help to the district um, if we knew that. Okay. And I think there's kind of like a chicken or egg thing um, that, that goes on with this. I think the more that we have, the more riders that we have that are using it, um, the more of a need there is for us to identify common pickup points, which may be less convenient um, for those utilizing it, which then may lead to less using it. And then, so we get this kind of this cycle where um, there's like a mi missing piece of knowledge there that will really uh, help us. But we need the consortium and Royal Coach and others to really help us uh, gather that information. Great. Um, I don't have any more questions. That's all my questions. Um, the, the, oh, sorry, I have one last question, which is that we don't have another meeting scheduled before we have to approve the budget. So I think we have one. I could be wrong. I thought I so too, but we don't have a meeting for a month. April 13th. Is yeah, I think April 13th and then uh, the 27th, I believe, is budget adoption. But let me just so, uh, I think the schedule says BOCES budget. Yep. Oh, did I get confused? Is April 13th the BOCES budget? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, that's correct. So that's yeah, that's the vote. Of... So why does it say April? Sorry. The, the 16th, not the 13th. The 13th, the 13th, the 13th. Yep. So the 6th, 16th is, um, happens to be the date of the BOCES uh, budget. I election. see, I see, I see. Um, and okay. I'm, that that will provide corrected. one opportunity for any continued questions, conversations related to this, okay. updates, changes, right. anything that you want us to explore and bring back to the group. Uh, but on the 23rd is when we'd be seeking um, budget okay. adoption. Okay, great. And, mm -hmm. and oh, perfect. Okay, any other before we wrap? So the next meeting is when? April 16th. April 16th, okay. which of course I said earlier this evening, but then clearly didn't. But I actually just had the wrong, date wrong date dates on the agenda. Say it again. There's April 5th, April 5th as a regular meeting and April 19th as a regular meeting. April 5th is a Friday. I know. <laughs> <laughs> what did you, what's on the agenda from the regular meeting from tonight? Under the okay. Schedule of we'll, work, we'll work on that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'll go back to that. Okay. Yeah. We got this. Yep. Okay. Um, so sorry, our next meeting is okay. April 16th. Yes? Yes. Yes. Correct. Okay. So um, can I have a motion to, do I need a motion? Let's have a motion to adjourn. We'll just so move. Yeah, anybody? Anyone? Nilesh first and then Grace. And we are adjourned. Thank you everyone for staying. Appreciate you. your 